James chapter 4. Now I'm going to ask you this, if you would. I know you. Um, <coughs> I know you'll pray for us, but uh, but if you would, uh, remember my wife in December. She's going to have a treatment on her eye. She's having a lot of trouble with her left eye. She's got the shingles virus in it, uh, and uh, cannot see out of it. it. It hurts her a lot. It's giving her grief every day. And so pray that we can get something that will give her some relief. All right. Amen. All right. James chapter four. Just a simple verse. And it says this in verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Let's talk to the Lord. Father, we thank you now, God, for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you, God, for your very great kindness. Lord God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you, Father, that <clears throat> again, in a country that, that almost daily, almost daily uh, becomes more hostile to your Bible, uh, and to you and to Christianity, we're still here. We're still free. We appreciate that, God. And we pray, Lord, that we will use our freedom to your glory. Lord, that's, uh, that's the reason we were put here. I ask you, God, to bless every single person that came here. There's somebody here probably doesn't feel good. Somebody didn't feel like coming. But they came. And so, Lord, I pray that you bless them for their attendance. I pray also, God, that uh, you'll bless them by their attendance, that something that is said uh, will be in some way an encouragement, uh, maybe edifying, uh, made him mo motivate them to live better for thee. And that's the desire, God, that your people would be edified, that being edified, they would then live to your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Now, I don't know if you've uh, happened but hap or, or heard this, but it's, uh, it happens to everybody. It happens to us time and time again. You know, you have somebody come by, they want to sell you something, uh, and, uh, and they're going to, you know, like this guy comes by with a $200 sweeper, wants to sell it to you for $800, but tonight only $400. And you say, uh, well, give me a couple of days to think about that. He goes, oh, no, this is the only chance you got. <laughs> After tonight, it's 800 bucks. This is your one chance uh, for me to sting you for only 200. But, um, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, you say, well, then I'll pass. And then a couple of days later, he calls and goes, I'm going to give you another chance. I mean, time and again, you know, we hear this, uh, this is your only chance to do this. Uh, and then you find out they give you another only chance and another only chance and another one chance. Guys, I want to tell you what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I'm going to talk to you about your one chance. Now, you know what one chance is? That means there is no instant replay. You know, I fear for some of our very young, uh, I'm not against computer games, you know, but, but uh, the worst thing about some of them is that they get killed in them and they got five more lives. <laughs> really? I talk to grown-ups, you know, and they'll say, well, I messed up, but next time through. There is no next time through, guys. This is our one chance. Now, let me explain to you what one chance is. <clears throat> you know, out there on the table, I think it was last night or the night before, uh, I held up the Fight On book, and that was volume one. And if you look at volume two, it shows a World War II bomber. That bomber is a B-24. Those bombers carried 10 men in every one of them. So if two of them went down, 20 guys. In one, bomb, uh, in one bombing mission, 60 planes went down. We lost 600 men. Uh, that, that, that's an amazing thing for one day. But anyway, um, and, and you know, they go in, uh, they go in wingtip to, to, to wingtip. Uh, I talked to a guy that was the, that was the waste gunner on a B-24 during World War II. And, and what they would do is they would fly very close together so that they could use all of their firepower to keep the Germans back uh, and also so they couldn't dive through the formation. And, and, you know, I've seen them in, in the movies, you know, they fly close together. And, and uh, if you have some, maybe some uh, film clips from World War II, you know, you see them flying close together. <clears throat> and I said, uh, how close did you guys fly? How close was it? Now, now, understand, the waste gunner didn't have any glass. It was an open hole at 10,000 feet with a 50 caliber sticking out there in the slipstream. He said, I knew we were close if while we were flying in formation, I could reach out and touch the wingtip of the plane next to us. That's close. And once they got into the, over the targets, you know, there'd be flak blowing up around them and, and fighters going down. There'd be a lot of confusion. And this happened. <clears throat> now, let me explain this about it. In a, in a World War II fighter, the pilot always wore a parachute. He actually wore it low. It was right here. He, it was the seat that he sat on. Uh, there was no padding on that seat. He sat on that parachute because he's in a cockpit this big. Uh, if he gets shot down, he has no time to put a parachute on. In a bomber, they had the 10 parachutes, but they had them stored in places in the, uh, in the plane because they figured, you know, uh, they would have some time to put a parachute on. 
And, and in, uh, I think it was uh, November of 1944, <clears throat> at 10,000 feet, two B-24s came together in midair and crashed. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but when that kind of thing happens, everybody doesn't die in the accident. They, they fall until they don't die until they hit the ground. Now, you have 20 men spilled out into the space at 10,000 feet, and not one of them has a parachute on. And one of them lived. Yeah, he didn't. I just made that up. I don't see what your reaction was. <laughs> well, he did. Yeah, one guy lived. One pilot lived. And, and everybody's flabbergasted how this guy lived. And he, they said, how did you live? And he said, now understand this. You got 20 men falling to their death amidst the rubble of two entire planes. That's eight engines, that's wheels, tires, radios, seats, everything, wings and, uh, and parts. <clears throat> and he said, he, he's fallen in a debris field. And he said, I'm falling, you know, like this on my back. And he said, I looked over and right here, falling right beside him was a parachute pack. Well, he's got one chance, doesn't he? <laughs> now, here's my luck. My luck, I'd reach for it and go, <laughs> But, but um, he, said, I, he said, I looked over and he said, I saw that parachute pack and he said, I reached over and he said, I grabbed the strap. And he said, as he tumbled through a few thousand feet, he put that parachute on, pulled the ripcord and saved his life. Now, had he, not, had he done something that batted that parachute away, was he going to get another chance? No, that's one chance. That's what you have tonight. You know, I, if I believe, I believe the messages I preach, okay? But if one ever touches my life, this is the one. Uh, and so I want to talk to you tonight about your one chance. Uh, I'll tell you another one. There was a fellow, and I think I got this in one of the fight on books, <clears throat> but he was a mountain man up in that uh, Montana, Idaho area, you know, and, uh, and there was a grizzly bear, and they were, uh, it was causing some havoc, and it was in a cave, and, and so him and some soldiers went, and they built a fire so the smoke would go in the cave to get this bear out. Well, he came out, <laughs> but he came out, I mean, full bore, brother. I mean, he was just really cooking, uh, wood and splinters all fell out of there, you know, and, and of course, as he ran by, everybody tried to unload their single shot rifles, and this guy did, and they said that bear ran about 50 feet out, uh, out from the mouth of that cave, then turned around, came straight back, and he's headed right for this mountain man, and he's already shot his one shot on his rifle, and he said, this bear is coming full tilt for this mountain guy, and he says, <clears throat> they said he just stood there, and he reached over here, and he pulled his hatchet out his tomahawk, and he said he stood there like this. And these, these soldiers watching this guy just standing, he's not running or nothing. They said, he, said, he said he thought he timed the best he could, and he said when that bear got right in front of him, this guy went, Wah! and that's all they saw, because they said that bear took him, and they both rolled about 20 more feet, and that bear was on top of him, dead. And they pulled that bear off, he climbed out okay. <laughs> Boy, and they said that bear had that hatchet split right in his skull. That's one chance, right? And so I'm going to talk to you about the one chance you have. <clears throat> but before I do, I want to tell you how important you are. And this is real easy. You're not. <laughs> See, wasn't that easy? You know, we've got, a, we've got a generation or two or three that just think the world revolves around them. Uh, I don't know if you heard, uh, I think when uh, Obama got in office, he gave away that money, you know, in that uh, bailout. And, and you hear those executives, you know, that, that took the bailout money and gave themselves all these great bonuses. And I heard people criticizing those guys. I'm not critical of those guys. You say, you think what they did was right? Oh, I think it was wrong. Yeah, I think they were wrong. I said I'm not critical of them. You know why? Because those men, from the time they were this big, wore a t-shirt that said, it's all about me. Right. They were told from this big, you're a champion. You know what they're saying in some of our public schools? I'm the most important person I know. They're singing that. And so those dead guys, those, those executives from this big, they, th they were told by everybody, their parents and everybody else, you're important, feel good about yourself, uh, everybody needs you, there's nobody better than you. And so when he got the money in his hand, you know what they thought? Who, who deserves this more than me? Right. And we get this idea, you know, where would the world be without me? Well, look, let me tell you how important you are. Let me tell you how important I am. We will probably be dead for two weeks before anybody notices we're gone. That's how important we are, <laughs> all right? I hate to tell you, pal, but if you died today uh, or I died today, the world wouldn't stand still, the sun would still come up, uh, and most people do real well. But let me explain. When I say uh, how important you are, did you ever think about this? 
Now, I'm a subscriber to the fact that we have 7,000 years of recorded history. You have eternity, and there's 7,000 years, and we have gone 6,000 years. We've got 1,000 more years to go. Now, the amazing thing is look how much God got done before we even showed up. I mean, he didn't need your help. All right, let me ask you this. You ever had a problem? Have you ever had a problem? Not really. Now, I know we say, I'm asking God to take care of this. We don't really ask God to take care of it. You know what we do? We tell him how to take care of it. No, I do it too. Believe me, I do it too. Here's how I think. All right, got two questions. Number one, doesn't God know everything? Then number two, he must know I'm right. (laughs) (laughs) And what I do is, uh, you know, when I have a problem, I, I, I write out the script on what God should do. I send it on up to heaven. He reads it over. Then he tosses it behind his back and goes about doing what he wanted to as though he were God. And think about this. You know that God spoke the universe into existence and you weren't there and I wasn't there and our parents weren't there and our grandparents weren't there and our great-grandparents weren't there and he got it right anyways. You know, I was witness this fellow one time and he was a PhD. He was a physicist, you know. Uh, and I was setting him up, you know. I said, um, I said, tell me what you believe. Now, can I explain something to you? Look, can I help you? Don't be intimidated by anybody that goes to science. I mean, now you say, well, I don't believe the Bible. That's superstition. Ask them what they believe. Here's this grown man, PhD, college professor, and he says, uh, why, there was this big cloud of dust, and it uh, blew up, and, and the universe came out of that. Well, throw away your Bible on that one. (laughs) I mean, guys, I am not an explosives expert, but if that guy's true, we could take this pulpit out in the middle of a parking lot or out in the middle of a field somewhere, put a stick of dynamite in it when it blows up, and the smoke clears, you got a three-bedroom house. (laughs) Isn't that what the guy believes? Now, let me explain. Uh, You know, he went through 4.6 billion years, uh, and, and while he's doing this, I am doing everything I can to snicker and laugh and chuckle. You say, oh, you weren't laughing at him. I sure was. Oh, weren't you afraid you offended him? Well, first off, when they're that stupid, they're too dumb to be offended. That's true. (laughs) But the second thing is this. When when they tell you what they believe, you'd better chuckle. Because if you don't, they're going to think you're taking them serious. Ain't nobody ought to take those guys serious. But then he said this to me, you know, because he knew what I wanted. And he wanted me to, uh, I said, I said, how do you think it all came into being? He he wanted me to tell him how I thought it all came into being. Now, have you heard anybody talk about tolerance? Yes. We need to be tolerant. Isn't it funny people can be tolerant of anything and anybody except a Christian? Yes. And, and people who believe in evolution, they never say this. They never say, well, you know, you believe in creation, I believe in evolution, but oh, you know, I tolerate it. They always go, and they don't say, you believe in creation? They go, you really believe in... I mean, they, when they ask the question, you start shrinking. <laughs> And that's what this guy did, man. He goes, he goes, you really believe that God just spoke the entire universe into existence in seven 24-hour days? Guys, forgive me. Please forgive me, because I knew if I said yes, he'd think I was the dumbest thing on two legs. So I said no. Six. Because <laughs> I think he spoke it into existence in six days, not seven at all. If God created anything on the seventh day, it was iced tea. <laughs> Because he was just kicking back, enjoying what, looking at what he just done for the last six days. Come on, you find any man that's ever got something done, he doesn't work for two weeks. He just stands there and looks at the doghouse he built. Look at that. More iced tea, woman. Look what I built. <clears throat> hey, you know what? Isn't it amazing that God got the entire thing right and you weren't there and I wasn't there? I hate to tell you this. You know, if you go have surgery, you know why they, uh, why they knock you out? Well, they do that so you don't have any pain. That's not why. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, they give you local. You won't feel it. They put you out because they don't want you there. Yeah, Doc, doc uh, you think that's the right place cut? <laughs> oh, you're going to use that? Uh, doc, uh, do you think that's a big enough incision? Doc, do, 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 do. I mean, they want you out. They don't want you to kibitz. How did God get all this stuff right? And I, was, I, was, I would have tried to explain to him. I was trying to help him along. But he got it all right before I ever showed up. He, was, he got so much done. Uh, how about when God judged the earth? Genesis chapter 7. You know, one of the things I like about my God, there's a lot of things I like about my God. And, and I know you'll laugh when I say it, but I really believe this. 
He has a flair for the dramatic. If you ever hear anybody say, now, now, now I want you to say this, okay? If anybody ever says to you, well, the Bible is boring, say, you ever read it? You know, I always laugh at those people that say, I got an NIV because it's easier to read than a King James. And I always go, have you read it? No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's easier to not read an NIV than it is to not read a King James. I guess if I'm going to ignore the Bible, I'd just rather ignore the real thing. <clears throat> but our God has a flair for the dramatic. And here's what happens. He's looking down there in Genesis chapter 7. He gets so mad at the whole world, he said, I'm going to kill them. I am going to kill them all except for no one is family. I'm killing them all. Now, let me tell you, in the Bible, there's only two angels given by name. And I'm sorry, no Raphael. There is Gabriel and there is Michael. These two guys got a job. There's, there's, there were three entities. There was Lucifer, uh, 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 Michael, and Gabriel. <coughs> and each one of these guys got a third of heaven, third of the angels under them. Now, just for an abbreviation, Gabriel is the talker. Whenever God wants a message delivered, he sends Gabriel. You look in your Bible, and you'll see that Gabriel is the guy that shows up. In fact, that is so common that when an angel shows up and he's doing the talking, you know he's Gabriel. And you believe that before I told you. Because when somebody talks a lot, you say, aren't they Gabby? <laughs> well, where did that abbreviation come from? I mean, Mike is Mike, Mikey is Mike, and Gabby is Gabriel. And so we say, oh, what are you doing? Oh, we're just gabbing. That's where that comes from. So, so, so Gabriel is the talker. Michael is the archangel. Michael is God's hitman. When God wants somebody dead, Michael does dead really good. <laughs> and you don't even want him to bring the boys with him, all right? And so I can just see this, you know. God looks down there and goes, oh, I'm going to kill him. I'm, I'm just going to kill them all. And I can see Michael, man. I mean, he looks at one third of heaven, pulls out his sword and says, come on, guys. And God says, whoa, 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 what are you going to do? He said, you want him dead? Dead. That's what we do. <laughs> well... I think I'm going to do something different. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, let me, let me think. Huh. You ever seen rain? Do you know how the water's been coming up from the ground? Yeah. I'm going to have it come down from the sky. <laughs> it never does that. I'm going to now. <laughs> I think I'm going to have it rain for 30 days. No, I'll make it 40. <laughs> Guys, I mean, you... You're, I, we, we did the math one time when I was in Bible college, and if all of the mountains were as they are right now, to be covered in 40 days, it had to, it had to rain two and a half feet a minute. The earth had to, literally the water had to rise two and a half feet in every 60 seconds. That, you see these guys, you know, when they're protesting, they hit them with a fire hose, that doesn't even compare. If you walked outside, the volume of water would knock you down. But you got to admit, uh, it's dramatic. And isn't that amazing? God got that right, and you weren't there, and I wasn't there. And then you read there where God was going to destroy those five cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and San Francisco. <laughs> I think that was the other way. Anyway. <clears throat> and, and you know what he said? He looked down there, and he goes, I'm going to kill him. And I can just hear Michael go, Okay, guys, open the water valves. And God says, well, well what are you doing? Well, well, you, you want them dead? We're, we're going to drown them. I already did water. Well, what are you going to do this time? Well, let me think. <laughs> you ever seen fire and brimstone from heaven? This is kind of like fireworks in reverse. <laughs> don't you think? You ever see fireworks? Come on, don't you think that's exactly what it had to look like? If you were afar off and you saw the judgment of God falling on all those four cities, it was like fireworks in reverse. Guys, our God has a flair for that's the dramatic. Right. That's right. And I appreciate that. The Bible is not a boring book. And it just amazes me that he got it right. When God chose Abraham <coughs> and the nation of Israel, he got it right. And you read in your Old Testament, you read the ups and the downs. You know, really, if you think of the Old Testament and you want to do a, bar, a, a graph, basically, it's a line like this. Where, and what is it? So that's, that's the history of Israel. They're right with God and God is blessing them. They turn their back on God and God judges them. They get right and he blesses them. They turn their back and he judges them. And their whole history, read the Old Testament, and it's just the ups and downs. I mean, how can you say it? It's the ups and downs of the nation of Israel. And when God judged them and everything he did, <coughs> he was always right. 
What about the life of Jesus Christ? Have you ever thought about this? Jesus never did anything wrong. You know that nobody on earth ever in history honestly testified against Jesus Christ? This man was so good that they could only get two guys to witness. They had to pay them and they couldn't agree. When he, look, if you think about this, <clears throat> if Jesus started at this street corner and walked to this street corner, everybody in between, when he started at this end and got to this end, by the time he got here, everybody in between that had been blind could now see. Everybody that had been deaf could now hear. Everybody that had been mute could now speak. Isn't that true? The palsied were carrying their beds home with them. Did you ever think about this, guys? Jesus ruined every funeral he attended. Because right. the body kept going home with its mother. Isn't that true? Do you know that every place you go, I was talking to your pastor, and I can't, I can't think of a time in the Bible where Jesus ever took anything from anybody. He was always the giver. He said it's better to give than receive. He was always giving, always giving, always giving. And could you explain this to me? This is somebody, now look, the world says, oh, we're concerned about the hungry. Then wouldn't you want to get in touch with somebody who could take five loaves, two fish, and feed 5,000 guys and their families? Yes. Well, we're, you know, we're marching for the cure. We're trying, to, we're trying to cure this disease. If you really cared about stopping disease, wouldn't you get somebody, all they do is walk by and touch them, and they, could, they were healed? How is it? You say, well, we care about the kids. Jesus Christ cared about the kids. How can this world say they care so much and hate the one individual that did everything they said they wanted, to, wanted done? Guys, what I'm telling you is, he did it all right. He was completely correct. What about the early church? You know, he used the early church. I mean, 5,000 saved here, 3,000 saved here. They went here, they went here, they went here. You know, they brought the gospel. They went up from Jerusalem. <clears throat> we saw it on that board on Sunday. They went from Jerusalem into Europe. For it, it, uh, you know, you know uh, we think of Africa. We got some black folks here. We think of Africa. People say, well, they live in tribes. I got news for you, pal. Everybody lived in tribes. Right. I don't care what color you are. You white folks, your European, back, your, your European go back far enough in your lineage, and your folks lived in tribes. Right. We all lived in tribes. And we all just, what we do is we planted our crops and beat each other's brains out until it was harvest time. <laughs> That's really what it was. You say, then what happened? When that gospel went into Europe, those guys said, you know, this Bible is a good thing. They abandoned tribalism. They started nationalism. And that's how it, it, uh, Europe became an, uh, a group of nations. Then it crossed into England. Then that thing went across the Atlantic and it came over here. I don't know if you realize what the greatest thing Patrick Henry ever said was, but it's not give me liberty or give me death. You think that's the greatest thing Patrick Henry ever said because that's the only thing you know he said. <laughs> you don't know a second thing. Do you know what the greatest thing he ever said was? I'll have the pepperonis lover with the stuffed crust. <laughs> no, no, that's the third greatest thing he ever said. No. The greatest thing Patrick Henry ever said was this. Uh, and it's out there in that little uh, booklet uh, with the American flag on it. <clears throat> he said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists but by Christians, not on religions but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Isn't it amazing? You know, you, you guys don't realize the history of that great King James Bible, but King James' mother was a Roman Catholic. Yeah. King James' son, who took over after him, went back to the Catholic Church. You got a Catholic here and a Catholic here, and one guy in between that was not a Catholic, he was a Protestant, and that's when we got our Bible. I mean, it was like, it was like shooting an arrow through, through a crack in the board that big, and God got it right. Yeah. And he did it without you there and without me. Sometimes I'm amazed that he could get so much right. What about, what about our own history? You know, I was raised in public school. You know what that means? That means I was lied to five days a week. <laughs> really, really, I was. Uh, I was told this. I was told that Christopher Columbus came here four times. He did. They said he was interested in gold. He was not. Now, I'll tell you something, guys. You can lie about a dead man unless he wrote a book. And Christopher Columbus wrote a book in his native language of Portuguese, and his book was called The Book of Prophecy. And Christopher Columbus was a saved man. Do you know what his favorite book of the Bible was? Isaiah. You know why that's significant? Because it's, it's in Isaiah where the Bible says, I saw God sitting on the circle of the earth. That's where he got that from. And Christopher Columbus, in, his, in this book of the prophecy, wrote this. He said, God has laid it on my heart to take the gospel to a people who have never heard it. Now, maybe, uh, you know, King Ferdinand and, and, and Queen Isabella, maybe they were interested in gold. 
But I'm telling you, Columbus had his sights set a little bit higher. Here's what they told me about this guy. He came here four times, ready for this, and never knew where he'd been. Could, could you explain to me how you go someplace four times, don't know where you've been? I mean, that's pretty good, isn't it? If you don't mind, every now and then I have a discussion with Christopher Columbus. I figure if Hillary can talk to Eleanor Roosevelt, I can talk to Christopher Columbus. He's got to be better looking than Eleanor Roosevelt. I saw a tree stump that was better looking than Eleanor Roosevelt. But anyway, I see him. You know where I catch him? I catch him between, between his third and fourth voyage. We're, we're walking, you know, just passing by on the streets of Barcelona. I say, Chris, how you doing? He says, real good. I said, where you been? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> so where are you going? I'm going back. Where? I don't know. <laughs> you want to come with me? No, I'm going to get on a boat where somebody doesn't know where they've been. But you know, Christopher Columbus brought that gospel over here. And, and that began this great nation. And God got it right. In 1588, <coughs> in 1588 was the defeat of the Spanish Armada. And Spain was going to come up. And listen, Spain had the British outgunned. They were going to come up, uh, they were going to, they were going to come up uh, the Atlantic coast, to come into the English Channel. They were going to invade England. They were going to bring England forc forcibly back into the fold of the Roman Catholic Church. And God used Sir, Fa Sir uh, Francis Drake and, and defeated the Spanish Armada. Do you understand that but for that battle, if it had gone the other way, all of history since then would be different? And we would probably be speaking Spanish, and we'd probably be uh, worshiping in a Catholic church with no gospel. God got it right. Uh, our King James Bible. Um, there was no, there was no uh, collated Greek New Testament until 1516, and I won't go into all of the five, ver the, the five editions of it. But God put this book together in 1611. Now, there were some English Bibles prior to 1611. And people ask me, well, how come, well, why would it be the King James Bible? There were, there were several Bibles before that. Why not one of those? And I can only give you two. Now, I can't tell you why, because God didn't tell me. I'm going to tell you what I think. The first thing I think is this. Every Bible prior to the King James was a one man or one group translation. You had the Wycliffe Bible done by one man. You had the uh, Tyndale Bible done by Richard Tyndale. You had the uh, Cover Coverdale Bible done by Matthew Coverdale. Uh, you had the, um, the Thomas Matthews Bible. Guess who translated that? Thomas nope. John Rogers. You say, then why do you call it Thomas Matthews? Ready for this? Because they were burning Christians at the stake, and he knew if he put John Rogers on, they'd burn him, so he called himself Thomas Matthews. <laughs> you say, what happened to him? They burned him at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> he ended up dying to steak anyway. Might as well. But now, now we don't have a John Rogers version. He should have given his name to it, guys. But those were one-man translations. You had the Bishop's Bible. That was done by, by, for the Anglican Church. You had the, um, the Geneva Bible. That was done for the Puritans. So every Bible was one man or one group. Do you know who translated that Bible? It's called a King James Bible. He didn't translate it. It was one of the first ones done by a committee, and it was done by a committee of... Anglicans and Puritans. That's kind of like saying this. It was done by Democrats and Republicans. Right. You say, well, what did that do? Well, the Anglicans made sure it wasn't a Puritan Bible, and the Puritans made sure it wasn't an Anglican Bible. So it wasn't a one-man Bible, and it wasn't a one-group Bible. I don't know if that's the reason. The other thing is that our English language, I don't know if you realize this, but your English of the King James Bible, with all those these and thous, that is not Old English. If somebody spoke Old English here, you would think they're speaking a foreign language. Uh, we were in Ireland, and we saw this, um, we saw this sign, and it looked like somebody just threw letters at it, and they didn't land in the right order. And wherever they had a question mark, they just put a, a mark here and a, an accent there. And, uh, and I said, what is that? And they said, that's Gaelic. And that's very much what, what Old English looked like. It looked very much like Gaelic. If you heard somebody speak Old English, you would not know it was English. And from old, it went to Middle English. You wouldn't understand Middle English. You might pick up one or two words because by that time, some of the words were beginning to sound like what we know as English. But the King James Bible is not in Old English. It's not in Middle English. Ready for this? It's in Modern English. That is a Modern English. Well, we need a Modern English translation. Got one. <laughs> King James Bible. But there were, the, the English language was still fluid. And by the end of the 1500s, which would be the beginning of the 1600s, there were finally some pronoun changes that took place that solidified our language, and now the language was ready for the Bible. Isn't that amazing? God got that right. That's just an amazing thing. And what, here's what I'm telling you guys. God got so much right.
And then there was this. Um, and, and here's the thing. You weren't there, and I wasn't there, right? I think go back about 160 years. There was a war in this country called the Civil War. I'm from Ohio. We won. <laughs> my, uh, my phone, when it, when it rings, it plays Dixie. And I was someplace, you know, and my phone went off, and this preacher was with me. He says, uh, I thought you're for the North. I said, I am. He said, how come your phone plays Dixie when it rings? I said, oh, man, we won. It's ours now. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> but here's the thing. People are upset about that war. They weren't alive when it happened. Their parents weren't alive when it happened. Their grandparents weren't alive when it happened. Isn't that right? <laughs> Guys, what I'm, what I'm telling you is look how much history has gone by, both in the Bible or in secular history, before you and I showed up. And God got it right. But, you're here now, right? Are you here now? Yeah. Okay, we're here now. So, so what, what are we? Can I tell you what you are? Oh, I won't say anything ugly. And I don't say this as a joke. Um, I say it as an analogy. You are an acorn. That's what you are. That probably signifies the size. Never mind. <clears throat> but, uh, but really, you are an acorn. You ever see an acorn? Acorn is about the size of my thumbnail. Let's go talk to an acorn. I, if I can talk to Christopher Columbus, I can talk to an acorn. Let's go out there. You know, we're gonna find, we find this acorn laying on the ground. Well, he's had a bad day. I mean, he's all agitated. I said, what's the matter? <laughs> bad day? Uh, what's the matter? You know where I was this morning? No, where were you? Ah, I was about 30 feet up on that limb, me and my acorn buddy, Bill. <laughs> really, what were you doing? Just hanging around. <laughs> so what happened? Squirrel. <laughs> Came out on that limb. He was going to eat us alive. What did you do? I jumped. <laughs> I bounced off about 15 limbs before I landed here. What happened to Bill? I can still hear him screaming. <laughs> now, you know what that, listen, if that acorn could think, if it could talk, you know what it thinks? It thinks it was made to be an acorn. You know it was never made to be an acorn? Are you ready for this? It wasn't made to be an acorn for one entire year. It's amazing, you know, and I got nothing against farmers, but farmers are amazing. Man, they plow this ground, they level it, they take the rocks out of it, they, 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 uh, they plant these things, and man, it's so meticulous, and they put it down the right, uh, the right depth. I mean, they plant this one this far below, and they plant this one this far below, and they put the right fertilizer. You know how God plants things? He throws it on top. He drops the acorn on top of the ground, and somehow, I don't know what God, what is this thing? It really doesn't, it can't think, but it knows what to do. And that acorn becomes a Baptist. And it splits. Because if that's not Baptist doctrine, nothing is. And, and it sends down these little shoots into the soil. And then this little green thing shows up. And then it becomes a little sprig. And then it becomes a little sprout. And then it becomes a sapling. Now look, that acorn wasn't made to be an acorn for one entire year, right? It was made to be an oak tree for what? 120 years. 130 years. Let's go talk to our acorn 100 years later. Oh, don't look down now. Oh, man, he's standing out there like this. I'm in that acorn. We're going to say, hey, how you doing? Great. <laughs> I remember the last time I talked to you, uh, you were just an acorn. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, you were having trouble with a squirrel, you and your friend Bill. Oh, Bill. <laughs> I can still hear him scream. Any squirrels giving you trouble? Back then I was scared of them. Now they live in me. <laughs> well, hey, man, we had a wind last night. Uh, do any damage? No, I blew out a little dead wood, but I'm just like a Baptist church. I'm better for it. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what I'm telling you guys. If that acorn could think, it would think that it was made to be an acorn. But it was never made to be an acorn. It was made to be an acorn for one brief period of time, be planted, and then become an oak for many, many years. If we've got 7,000 years, and I believe we've got 7,000 years, uh, and if we've got 7,000 years, here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to take a piece of string, imaginary, we're going to attach it to this wall, and like a clothesline, we're going to walk over here, and we're going to attach it to that wall. And we're going to take our 7,000 years of history, and we're going to put it right here in the middle. Now, if our 7,000 years of history is right here, that means that wall is a million years in the past. 
Please understand, I don't believe there was a million years in the past. But I got to have this or the string falls. So, <clears throat> so that wall would be a million years. But that one is a million years in the future. You believe in that one, don't you? In fact, we're heading for that wall. How long is it going to take us to get there? A million years, thank you. <laughs> now, here's two million years of time. Right in the middle of that, God puts out 7,000 years of world history. And you know how much you and I get? 1%. 70 years. That's all we get. You say, well, I know people live longer than 70 years. Yeah, but the warranty's up at 70. Yeah. <laughs> it is harder to get parts, okay? <laughs> so here you are. You are given 70 years. And, and look, you don't even have to get 70 years. You can get, uh, you get 80. You get 90. Get 100. But if we could take your 70 years and put it on this, on this uh, uh, scale, and there's our 7,000, do you know what your life looks like? The edge of that business card. Every single one of us. You know what we've got? Look, here's what you are. You are born, live, and die in the thickness of the card stock of that business card. Not this. Not that part. But just the very edge. And a bunch of us, well, maybe not a bunch, but my wife and I, we're, farther than, we're more than halfway across. All right? But here's what I'm telling you guys. You know what this is? I call that the blink of an eye. I call that the flash of a camera. You know what God calls that? He calls that a vapor. So here you are. You have got this much time on this planet. Isn't that true? And you know what some of you think? You think that, that your whole existence, the, 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 the main purpose of your existence is to enjoy this here. Now look, we're all going to get to this side of this card. We're going to get there one of two ways. One by one, we're going to die. Correct? And if I die or you die, we start right now and we're on that trip for that wall a million years away and beyond. Or the Lord's going to come back and take us out of here corporately and then we all start this, this, this journey together. But one way or another, we're going to be out here. Now stop and think about it. Look at this and the distance to that wall. That's a million years. Do you understand how little this is? Boy, you know, you know what we think? You think, well, man, I've got to really enjoy this life. No, no. You know what this is? This is when you're an acorn. This is, this is when you're preparing for that. That's what this is all about. Guys, here's what I believe your one chance is. Now, let me ask you a question. When we get on this side, when we're in heaven, okay, you're not going to be problems, right? No grief, no homework, no taxes, no Democrats. Anyway, let me ask you this. When we're on this side, are we not going to praise God? Aren't we going to praise God? Amen. And we're going to praise God. You know why? Because it's natural. Here, praising God will be natural. You might praise God here, now, but it ain't natural. All right? It is not natural for us to praise God. Uh, let me tell you about this guy uh, I was uh, going to Bible college with uh, some years ago when I was at Bible college. <clears throat> he was a guy from the South. Now, we were building houses. He worked on another crew, and, and he came in. And, and for you uh, ladies, anybody here that's never done carpenter work, you ever, you ever hear about somebody hitting their thumb with a hammer? Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you. There's two ways you hit your thumb with a hammer. There's what we call the surprise. And the surprise, you know, you're nailing these little seven-penny nails, and boom, 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 boom. Oh, oh, man, that hurts. Man, that hurts. And that's, that's a surprise. Now, that's, that's, for me, that's where it stops. I do have some brethren that... Like, this doesn't hurt enough, they've got to drill a hole in it with their, with their knife. But anyway, but that's a surprise. But then there's what we call the intercontinental ballistic missile shot. <laughs> if you've ever decked, you got these seven penny nails, you've got a 16 ounce hammer, but you can set them and drive them with two wax. I mean, you're up on a roof with about a half a dozen guys, and it's boom, 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 boom. This guy came into class one night. And he had this thumb. I mean, it was that big. It was wrapped. And it looked like something out of a cartoon. I said, brother, what'd you do? He says, I hit my thumb with a hammer. <laughs> I told you something. It took him three tries. But anyway, um, I said, what happened? He goes, oh, brother. Now, here's what happened. You're, you're really nailing this on the intercontinental ballistic missile shot. You got that hammer back here. When it moves a quarter of an inch, you already know it is predestinated from before the foundation of the world for you to splatter that thumb with that hammer. There ain't nothing you can do about it. And this to this takes about an hour and a half. 
That's a great time to reflect and talk to God. And he said, brother, he said, we were up on this roof. <clears throat> and he said, I moved that hammer about that far. And he said, I knew it. He said, I knew I had that thumb. I said, what'd you do? He said, I went to prayer. I said, you were praying you wouldn't hit it? He goes, no, nope, I knew I was going to hit it. I said, what'd you pray about? He said, I said, Lord. He said, I'm about to hit this thumb with this hammer. He said, I'm going to hit it hard. He said, I got a half a dozen lost guys up here I've been witnessing to. You know what I'm going to want to say. Please don't let me shame you because I'm about to bam. <laughs> Scared you. He said, I knocked the meat slap out the side of it. I said, what you? He said, man, he said, I hit that thing. He said, I dropped that hammer. He said, it cracked like a shot. When I dropped that hammer, he said, half a dozen lost guys up on that roof, they put their hammers down. He said, I'm, I'm down my knees like this. I went, I went, oh! He said, six guys are waiting for it. He said, I went, praise the Lord! He said, when I said that, man, it sounded like a gunfight up there, man. He said, they all grabbed their, their hammers. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Guys, saying praise the Lord is not natural. Isn't that right? I mean, you might have done something. What you said was way more natural than what he said. What I'm telling you is <coughs> that, that, that when we get here, living for God, praising God, do you understand that you are never, ever, once we get over here, you're never going to break his heart? You know, I don't know how you, what, what you worry about uh, as far as failing God. You know why I don't want to fail him on this side? I don't want to shame him. After all he's done for us, I don't want to do anything <clears throat> that I bring shame to his name. But once we get over here, there's no chance of us shaming him, right? And that's your chance. You know what I think our one chance is? This is the one chance we have to praise God of our own free will. Yeah, you'll praise Him over here because it's natural. You'll praise Him here because, because you want to do it. Hey, I, you know, I probably mentioned it here, but let me ask you, you ever go to church when you didn't feel like going? You ever go to church, I mean, you were mad at God? You were mad at the preacher? That'd be easy. You were mad at your husband, your wife, your parents, your kids, whatever the case may be, the, the evangelist. You were mad about something and you just said, you know what, I don't, as mad as I am, I shouldn't even be in church. I remember one time I was headed for church and I said, God, for two cents, I'd go back home and I got the two cents. But I kept on going. Guys, you know what I think? I think this. I think that when you show up at church, you're not feeling good, uh, you're upset about something, you're brokenhearted, you're grieving, you're scared, and you come to church anyway, I think that gives God a glory and a praise and some honor that we'll never be able to give Him when we get on this side. And look at it, guys. We can only produce it during that much time. All that other stuff, hey, that is going to be natural. And I'm glad God's going to get that praise. But I can't help think that, that this has got to have some kind of special thing. Let me, uh, let me ask you a question. Anybody here ever been to Hawaii? Okay, question. Did you go up Diamond Head? You sorry things. Nothing personal, right? Did you go up Diamond Head? Uh, Oahu. Main Island. Just down from, oh, you'd remember if you went up, Reg. Yeah, yeah. Let me explain here. If you fly into, if you, if you, you fly into uh, Honolulu International Airport, you're coming in, uh, and, and just beyond it is Pearl Harbor. You can see the uh, Arizona Memorial. Beyond Pearl Harbor, you'll see this built-up area. That's, uh, that's um, Honolulu. Beyond that is Waikiki. And then down there at the, down at the uh, farther below that, you'll see kind of what I, like a mountain like I was talking to you. It's kind of uh, doorstop shaped. That mountain is not a mountain. That is an extinct volcano called Diamond Head. And, you know, all volcanoes have a crater at the top. And I would think, you know, like, let's say a crater that was uh, 50 yards across. Wouldn't that be big? You know how big the crater is on Diamond Head? One mile. Wow. From one side of that crater to the other, it is one mile. Now, it's extinct. It's been extinct for a long time. Do you know what's right in the middle of the crater of Diamond Head? An American Army base. There's a U.S. Army base. Here's what happened. <clears throat> You guys know about uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And, and at that time, Hawaii wasn't a state. It was a territory. But we were afraid that the Japanese were going to invade Hawaii. And back clear back in 1909, they did this. It wasn't actually uh, just before World War II. But you got this, you got this, the wall, it's called a caldera. That's what the crater is called. And, and here's this caldera. There's the bottom of it. Uh, and then you got this cone. And on the, on the, the side of that, that um, uh, caldera, that cone, that faces the water 
are these things that look like uh, um, pillboxes. You've seen in World War II, big old concrete things with a little slit, but there's no guns. The guns are a mile on the other side of the, of the caldera. All these things were, were observation posts. And morning and night, day and 24 hours, brother, from the time they attacked Pearl Harbor, those guys, they were just scanning the horizon. And what they're looking for is they're looking for uh, just the, the, the mast of a Japanese ship, and then another one, then another one. Then they know the Japanese were on their way. And those, those guys in those, in those uh, uh, observation posts, <clears throat> here's what you do in the artillery. You call in two shots. You call a long shot, a short shot, then you adjust and fire for effect. If you go to Hawaii, you can go there. Uh, first time we went to Hawaii, I was in the Philippines in 1990. Kathy was over here. And on the way back, I had a, I had a meeting in Hawaii, so we had to get there three weeks to acclimate ourselves. <laughs> and um, actually, when we go to Hawaii, we work with a, an environmental group. You know those people, you know when the whales beat themselves and those people that save those whales, push them back out in the water? Man, I was there three weeks waiting for a whale. Uh, I, was, I was there long after we ran out of iced tea and sunscreen. But, um, but anyway, uh, in 1990, we were coming. I came in from the Philippines. Kath came in from the, from the mainland. And we went up the top of Diamond Head. Now, first off, remember I told you the road up a mountain goes back and forth. and back. So you drive this road up the side of the caldera. Now, look, you're coming up the side of this mountain, and you're going to come onto the floor of the caldera, but you got this cone. Well, you can't drive up here and boom, fall in. So, they, so they, they cut a tunnel. So you come up this thing and you drive through this car tunnel. And then you're out on the floor of this caldera. You drive a half a mile. There's a parking lot. You park yourself there. Uh, and you can see the army base around you. And then you start walking a half a mile to the other side, the inside of the caldera. About halfway there, it's concrete. And at about the halfway point, it just goes to gravel. Well, then you get to the edge of the caldera, now you start up. And guys, think about this. You're walking a path back and forth, back and forth, up the inside of a volcano. It is a rugged walk. There's no way to say it. I mean, there's no nice way to say it. <clears throat> it is just a tough walk. So this back in 1990, Kath and I are walking up there, walking up there. Then you come to a tunnel. Now, this is not a car tunnel. This is the people tunnel. It's only about this wide. And I am sure back in 1940, 41, 42, back there when the Army had that base, you know, when they were operating it there, I'm sure they had lights in it. But in 1990, they had no lights whatsoever. It was absolutely pitch black. You couldn't see. I walked in there. I could not see my hand this far in front of my face. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, why didn't you look at the light at the end of the tunnel? Because it's a dog leg. You can't see around the corner. There's absolutely no light. But... On the right side, as you're going up, on the right side is a little railing. You say, well, then I'll just hold on to the railing as I go up. Yeah, the only problem is everybody's coming down, they're holding on to the railing. <laughs> and this is nothing but head to head. I mean, you go into, now here, it is pitch black, and here's all you hear. Oh, excuse me, oh, oh ouch, oh, excuse, oh, pardon me, ouch. <laughs> and you're going through there, man. When you get through there, you are battered, you are bruised, and you've lost your watch. <laughs> You say, well, when you get through there, you're there, right? No. No, believe it or not, you are at the foot of steps. Now, the average house from one floor to the next takes 13 steps. You don't have a flight of 13 steps. You don't have a flight of 26 steps. You know how many flat steps you got? 99 steps. 99 concrete steps, and they are like this. Man, I got that far. I am winded. I'm tired of talking about it. <clears throat> anyway, I looked up those steps, and I thought, I'm going back. I am not going up. And I said, well, I'll go up, I'll go up. After I got done crying. <laughs> you get to the top of the 99 steps, you say, now you're there, right? No, you're in the basement. Now you've got three floors, you've got to go up on a spiral staircase while other people are coming down. When you get up the three floors, you walk into this observation area where you can look out over the Atlantic or over the Pacific, but you don't stay there. There's a little platform like a table. You climb up on this platform, you crawl out that viewing slit, right out onto the outside of the caldera. You say, what do you do then? You look around? No, man, you try to put your lungs back in your mouth. That's what you try. But, but, but there, now, now get this. There's no, you can't buy a bottle of water up there. You can't get any food. You can't get a Coke. If you could build a Burger King up there, you'd be a millionaire in a week. <laughs> oh, man, $45 for a Coke? Sure, thanks. And so you, you get up there. Now, when you're up there, man, do you have a view. 
You can see way out. You see out the, you can see Waikiki and, and Honolulu and, uh, and you see Pearl Harbor and you can see the airplanes coming in and, and departing from Honolulu International Airport. You can see some of the other Hawaiian Islands. It's a beautiful view. Well, now you got to go back. You crawl through this, this viewing slit. You get off the table. You come down the three flights on the spiral staircase while other people are coming up. You come down the 99 steps. Now you start through the tunnel. You're hanging on this. Oops, excuse me. Oh, oh, pardon me. Oops, oh, oops. Oh. And when you get through there, you are bruised and you are battered, but <laughs> you got another watch. And um, <coughs> you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You get down to the bottom. Now, you're headed back for the car. There's still people going up. And I got to tell you something, guys. It is a study of looking at the people going up and looking at the people coming down. The people going up don't know what's ahead of them. And they're like this. We're going up Diamond Head. We're going up Diamond And here's the people coming down. Uh, uh, uh. So my wife and I are coming down. Man, we are wiped out. I mean, at that time, I was only 40 years old. We were wiped out. And I'm watching these people go up. And we are right where, where we are, the gravel is now becoming concrete, which means for the people going up, the concrete's now becoming gravel. Here comes this guy, all by himself. Old guy. Really old guy. Somewhere around... A thousand. <laughs> you want to see what he looked like? There's his head. There he was. He had one of those canes that had four legs. And I'm telling you, he would put it out there, and it took him five minutes to walk up to it. And he, is, he thinks he's gone up Diamond Head. So I don't believe this. I don't believe any man. The ladies hope you wouldn't either. I don't think anybody let that guy get past you and not warn him of what's ahead of him. And so I stopped him. And I said, listen. I said, look, this, I mean, where he's going from concrete, now that gravel is going to be a little harder to walk on. I said, then you got to go up this path going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Then you got to go through this tunnel. Can you imagine him going through that tunnel with a cane in pitch blackness? You, can you see him going up 99 steps? Can you see him going up that spiral staircase? He ain't making it all right. And if somebody, unless somebody locks and loads him through that slit, he ain't going out there. And I told him, I said, look, here's what you got ahead of you. I mean, I went through it as best I could. When I got done, he goes, thank you. And kept on going. So a half hour later, he was like right there at the organ. I called him. Yeah. I said, uh, you going up? Yeah. I said, could I have your watch? He's not going to need it in half an hour. But anyway, <coughs> I thought about that for years. Now, I don't believe that guy ever made the top of diamond head. I don't believe that guy really could possibly have really believed in his heart that he's going to make it to the top of diamond head. So why do you keep on going? Why do you keep on going? I thought about that, thought about that. One day I told Kathy, I said, babe, I said, do you remember that old guy going up diamond head? She goes, yeah. I said, remember I told him and told him and tried to warn him off and he kept on going. She said, yeah. I said, I think I know why he kept on going. She said, why? I said, because if he'd have made it to the top, I'll bet you that wouldn't have been his first time. I'll bet the first time he was up there, he was about 20 years old, wearing his army uniform when he was stationed here during World War II. I said, I'll bet he remembered when him and the guys were running up there. They probably chased each other, who'd be the first one up there, pushing each other off the path, so you could be run up, run up the path, run up the, run through the tunnel, run up the steps, run up the, the spiral staircase. And I'll bet you when he mustered out of the army after the end of World War II, he said something like this, I'm going to come back here one of these days, and I'm going to go to the top of Diamond Head. You say, what do you think happened to him? Nothing. Got married, got a job, had kids, had to raise the kids. You know, it wasn't a time when everybody just said to their boss, I think I'll take a few weeks off and go climb Diamond Head. But now the kids are grown and gone. His wife was probably dead. I'm guessing the guy was somewhere around 80-something. Really, that's what he looked like. He looked to be about 83, 84 years old. And I think he said, you know, before I die, I'm going to go up Diamond Head. You know what I think? I think he waited too long. That's what I think. I don't think he ever made it up Diamond Head. And when I think of that guy, let me tell you what I think of. I think of many of the young men, maybe young ladies. Ladies, if you can jump on this, it's your, it's your prerogative. But I think of a lot of young men I have come up and they talk to me and they say this. I'm going to go be a football player, a golfer, a, uh, a, an athlete of some kind. I'm going to do this. And then when I get old and retire, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to give my life to God. 
And you know what I think when I hear that? Yeah, that's the thing to do. I mean when your body is at its strongest, when you're in your best health, when your mind is its sharpest, when your vision is its best, when your back is its strongest, when, when you have all of the natural strength of, of youth and all of the zeal of youth wasted on yourself. And after you've used it and expended it, and now all you can do is barely walk with a cane with four legs on it, then give God the leftovers. Guys, I'm telling you something. You know what I think? I think some people get here, and you know what they've done? Now, I know what I'm supposed to tell you. You know what I'm supposed to tell you? You're either going to live for God or the devil. That is not true. Maybe out of 100 people, if you take a, a Christianity, 100% of Christianity, maybe 10% are going to live for God. Maybe 10% are going to live for the devil. That 80%, they're going to live for themselves. Uh, I think of Vander Holyfield. I, 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 I've always admired him. Evander Holyfield is probably one of the greatest boxers in history. Evander Holyfield is a saved man. Evander Holyfield did something that no man has ever done. He is the only guy that ever won the heavyweight championship belt four times. Nobody ever won it four times. He is the only guy. Man, I saw his two fights with Mike Tyson. Uh, the first one, he TKO'd Mike Tyson in 11th round. And then the second one where, where Tyson sucker munched him. And... Um, <laughs> And, and, man, I saw his testimony, man. He I mean, I believe, I believe Vander Holyfield saved. What I'm telling you is that when we get here, somewhere before we get a million years out, I bet we run into Vander Holyfield. And if you run into a Vander Holyfield in heaven, ask him this question. Say, um, you're Vander Holyfield, aren't you? Well, yes, I am. You are the only man in history that won the heavyweight championship belt four times, aren't you? Right? Well, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Man, you know nobody else did that? That's an amazing feat. Well, thank you. Would you do me a favor? I'd be glad to. Show me one of the belts. Oh, you know, I can't. Um, they didn't let me bring any of them with me. I like the guy, but you know what I think he's done? He had one chance. He had one chance to live for God, one chance to use his health, to his strength, his mind, his body, everything he had, all of his energy. Hey, do you think about this, guys? Let me ask you. Is any gonna, anybody out here, once you're in heaven, is any gonna, anybody going to mistreat you because you're a Christian? Nobody's going to shortchange you. Nobody's going to badmouth you. Nobody's going to pass you over for promotion. Isn't that true? This is the only chance we've got to do something for God. This is our one chance. And I tell young people all the time, I'm not worried about you living for the devil. I don't believe you're going to live for the devil. Don't waste your life on you. I think so many people, you know, I, I know this isn't how it's going to happen, but I often said this, a bunch of Christians, you know what they're going to do for the first thousand years in heaven? They're going to walk bent over. For the first thousand years in heaven, they're going to walk bent over, and every time they see somebody, they're going to say, please kick me, because I was so stupid, because I had one chance to live for God, and I wasted it on me. I'll give you this, I'll be done. Anybody here ever been to Niagara Falls? Did you go over in the barrel? No. Oh, you wimp. <laughs> no, let me tell you about Niagara Falls. We went to Niagara Falls. Uh, and Niagara Falls, you know, it's, uh, it's impressive. First off, if you go to see Niagara Falls, you're going to go to Canada. Because the best view of Niagara Falls is from Canada. And Niagara Falls is what they call a double cataract. It, it starts uh, from the Canadian side. It starts over the United States, and it's kind of curved. And then it's, got, it's kind of like a lazy three, all right? Uh, and, and if you are on the Canadian side, they've got this large area of concrete, and then they've got a very stout steel rail so that you can't fall over it. And you watch that, that falls, and it starts in the United States. It comes out there, makes that first little lazy C, then another one. Do you know where it ends on the Canadian side? It does not end way down that hallway at the end of the building. It does not end right there where that back wall is where those windows are. It doesn't even end where that row is where your pastor's sitting. You know where it stands? When you're standing at this railing, it ends right at your feet. You can, if you wait, because everybody wants to be in that very one spot, <clears throat> but if you wait long enough, there's always people, you know, one guy moves, another one steps up. You can be right where Niagara Falls ends at your feet and drops 150 feet to the, to the rocks below. Rocks the size of this building. Now, if you've ever heard this, wide rivers are slow moving. Boy, you ever see the Susquehanna, brother? The Susquehanna is a mile wide and an inch deep. 
I think you could walk across the entire thing and it's barely moving. Not the Niagara. The Niagara, because that water is being sucked over there. It's dropping down. Uh, it is moving above the falls. It is moving so fast that, that it's not going over rocks and rapids. It's just bumping into itself. And they say that water will hit itself and not go up 10, 15 feet into the air. Let me tell you who was standing right there. Standing right there. It was, uh, it was July. I got to get it down here. July of 1960. And July 1960, standing right here, was a black truck driver from New Jersey by the name of John Hayes. He was 40 years old. You know what he thought he was going to do that day? He thought he was going to go see Niagara Falls. He crossed into the Canadian side, parked his car, walked over, waited for his opportunity. All he wanted to do is stand there to be right there where the falls ended. He got to that position, and what John Hayes didn't know, it was, it was 1966, it was... Uh, July 7th, 1966, one mile above the falls, a drama was taking place that would change his life forever. See, because that water moves so fast, they build hydroelectric plants. The water spins the generators, the, the turbines, and, uh, and generates electricity. And above the falls, there was a little aluminum boat, one of them little open boats, you know, with a motor on the back. Uh, in that was a guy by the name of um, uh, uh, James Hunnicutt. Uh, and James Hunnicutt was 40 years old, and in that boat with him were our, were our brother and sister. Uh, the girl was Diane Woodward, she was 17 years old, and her seven-year-old brother, Roger. And here's what Hunnicutt's doing. Hunnicutt helped build those hydroelectric plants. And he was a friend of the, of the Woodward family, so he was kind of doing a, a tour, and he was showing how the water goes into those tunnels and sp tells them how they spin the turbines and generates electricity. And he got too close uh, at one point, and the prop hit a rock and it sheared the pin. Now he's at the mercy of the Niagara River. The Niagara River doesn't have any mercy. You say, you mean they went over the falls in that boat? No. Oh, no, they couldn't stay in that boat. They were being swept down that river. They got into those rapids, and somebody said that boat shot 15 feet straight up near, dumped all three of them into the, Niag into the Niagara River. James Hunnicutt was swept over Niagara Falls and was killed. Seven-year-old Roger Woodward wearing nothing but a bathing suit and a life jacket, was swept over Niagara Falls and lived. They don't understand how he did live. They think maybe because he was so light, the water threw him out over the rocks. I don't know. I got a picture of him below the falls being picked up by a boat. Just looks like he's having a day at the lake. Which leaves one more person to be swept over the falls, and that's his 17-year-old sister, Diane, who's going to die. But you know where she's being swept over the falls? Not back there where the end of the building is. Not here where those glass windows are. Not even right there in that row where your pastor is. You know where she is going? She is, there's a wall. I mean, it's about a six foot wall. And that wall is, she is right here at that wall. And she's going to go over the falls. And stand right up there is John Hayes. Can you imagine what's going through her mind? She is looking up at those people. She is looking up at people who will never forget that they saw her die that day. You can hear her screaming. Can you hear her begging somebody to save her? You think that her scream wasn't, get, didn't get the attention of John Hayes and across there. Now, now that river's moving fast. She is moving fast. And their eyes connected. And she knew he was her only hope. And he knew he was her only hope. Let me tell you what John wanted to do. What he wanted to do was reach down there and save that girl's life. And like anybody else would, as she's coming, I mean, she's coming, coming, coming. And as he thought he timed it right, he leaned clear over top of that of that railing. They said they had to grab his ankles to keep him from flipping clear over the falls himself. But he, had, he, 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 he swung clear out there, and as she started over the falls, their hands touched and locked. And he pulled her up over that railing, saved her life. You know, if he'd have been a second too early or a second too late, that girl would have died. And he, there was going to be no instant replay. There's going to be, we can't run it back. It's not, oh, well, I got another life. He had one chance, didn't he? Right. Guys, you know what you got? I think all of us got one chance. We have got one chance to, to, to live to the glory of God when we don't have to. We have, look, you know what you could do? Everybody here, you could leave church tonight and never come back. I didn't say you have to go get on drugs and be immoral and be horrible. No, 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 just go live for yourself. Just get you a nice place and forget about God, you know. I mean, you guys live in Colorado, and church sure gets in the way of skiing and hiking and biking and camping. And just go out and enjoy life and waste the only opportunity you had to ever really praise God. Guys, 
you know, I, I told you, Kath and I, you know, we've been on the road for 28 years. We don't have a house. And um, you know, like when we leave here, we start a meeting on Sunday in San Diego at Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, go to another church for Wednesday, go to another church for Thursday through Sunday. And I've had meetings that literally, literally dovetailed, right? I had a meeting went Sunday through Wednesday. Then I started another meeting Thursday through Sunday, but that one ended at three o'clock on Sunday. So, so I started, I finished Saturday night, went to another church in the town and started one Sunday morning, came back to this church, did their three o'clock service, finished that meeting off, and then went on with another meeting that way. And I get this all the time. People say, well, why don't you slow down? Why don't you take some time off? You know why? Because I believe that message. That's what I believe. I believe the Lord's coming back, and if the Lord doesn't come back, He's going to take me home. One way or another, I know I'm going to get to this side of that card. I want every second to count. You understand? I'm not worried about I'm going to get out there and dope and drunk or anything else. You know what I'm just worried about? I'm going to get caught up with America. I'm going to get caught up with enjoying life and taking care of myself and seeing to it that I, I have pleasure. And so many people, they're going to waste their life on themselves. And then the Lord's going to come back. And they're going to have all of eternity. And you know what they're going to look back at? They're going to look back at, I had one chance. I had one chance. And I wasted it on me. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Let me tell you what's going to happen to somebody in this room. I don't know who it is, but it'll probably happen. If the Lord tarries is coming, you're going to get old. You're going to end up in a nursing home. Now, I know what you say. Well, I'm not going to a nursing home. Well, you think anybody in a nursing home ever said, I want to? Nobody said when they were 18 years old, boy, I hope I end my life in a really nice nursing home. But that's where you're going to end up. If not a nursing home, you're going to be in a bed somewhere. You're going to be so old in such bad health, <clears throat> you probably have trouble feeding yourself. You're not going to be able to get out of your bed and walk across your room and use your own bathroom. A lot of people have died in that position. Here's what you're going to hear on this morning. You're going to hear some footsteps coming down the hall of that hospital or of that nursing home. And those footsteps are going to sound different than any footsteps you've ever heard because these are the footsteps of death. And under his arm is a clipboard and at the top of that list is your name. And he's about 60 seconds from walking in your room. You are about 60 seconds from leaving this blink of an eye, this flash of a camera, this vapor behind. This this little acorn period of your life and step into to this eternity. You're going to heaven, you're saved. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. Now, if you're not saved, you're going to hell. Let me tell you what you're going to do in that 30 seconds or 60 seconds. You are going to do the most critical review of your life that's ever been done. And you think we preachers are too critical and too judgmental? Oh, man, listen. We're light stuff compared to what you're going to do. And I believe this. I believe there are going to be some Christians, they are going to die absolutely hating themselves. Not because they live for the devil, but because they just live for themselves. They had one chance never to be repeated. Look, guys, if we die tonight, or if the Lord comes back tonight, we will never be here like this again, ever. We will never have the opportunity to go to church, to pass a gospel tract, hey, to lead somebody else to Christ. Never have that opportunity again. And some people are going to look back and go, how could, I, how could I have that one chance and I wasted it on me? Now I got good news. You know what the good news is? There is still time to live for him. Amen. I base that on two great truths. You know what they are? He hasn't come back yet and you're not dead. Right. Now if he hasn't come back yet and you're not dead... I don't care what yesterday was. I don't care what the day before. I don't care what last week was like. I don't care who you lived for last year. I am telling you from this day forward, you can make every second count. And then when we cross that line, you'll look back and go, man, am I ever glad that I didn't waste my life on me. Father.